It looks like we're all ready to get started, so we'll jump right in. Hi, everybody. I'm Megan Raymond with WCET. Thank you so much for joining us for this lightning talk session on online student services. We have a really great group here, so I'm glad that you joined us for this conversation. We have two chat options, one on the right-hand screen and one in the blue bar below the video. To best organize questions for the speakers, we would like to use the chat feature in the blue bar for that purpose. But we will be monitoring both chats for your questions and comments. Please participate in the session by sharing your thoughts, posting links to resources, and or asking your questions. To help our moderator, if you're asking questions to the speaker, please indicate by using a question mark at the beginning of the question. And this makes it much easier as we're scrolling back through. Now I'd like to hand it off to our moderator for the session, Jory Hadsill, and we'll get started. Thank you so much, Megan. Hi, everyone. Uh, again, my name is uh, Dr. Jory Hadsill. I'm currently the executive director for the California Virtual Campus and also serve in as, at, as an at-large member on the WCT Steering Committee. Um, so great to be here as your moderator for this exciting session. Um, it's such a transformational time in online student services. And so we have some excellent presentations today and I'm really excited to, to get to those. Um, they're gonna move quickly because uh, these are lightning talks, uh, but we will have time for Q&A built in as Megan mentioned. So um, with that, I'd love to just go ahead and jump right into our first presentation. And I'd like to introduce to you Kate Moore, who is the Assistant Director of Enrollment Services at Ocean County College. Kate. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Um, like Jory said, I'm Kate Moore. I'm the Assistant Director of Enrollment Services at Ocean County College. So what that means is that I oversee our one-stop shop and all tier one services for academic advising, records and registration, um, admissions, and now cashiering as well, in addition to financial aid. If we could please go to the next slide. So a little bit uh, about OCC. We're located in Toms River, which is in central New Jersey. We're about an hour away from New York. 70% of our students are between the ages of 18 to 24. Most of our students are face-to-face. -face. Uh, the majority of our students have taken one or more classes online. And like many other two-year schools, we are seeing a decline in enrollment uh, as well as retention. It's been a struggle. Uh, right now, we're down uh, about 2.9% in enrollment, um, a little bit more for continuing students. That's where our biggest gap is. And uh, our One Stop was established in 2017 to increase the student experience, maximize student satisfaction. And, you know, with the pandemic, we had to pretty much go remote really, really quickly. If we could please advance to the next slide. Thank you. So within Ocean County College, uh, we have enrollment services, which is the hub. We're housed within student affairs, our one stop, which is what I oversee along with the staff and staff development. We launched in 2017 and our goal was 80% virtual, 20% physical. Now, what that means is, you know, largely we have all these systems in place to help students, to help them self-serve, to get them everything that they need. However, that doesn't mean that during times of peak enrollment that our, our line isn't uh, going out the door. Um, so it's definitely a lot of students still come in to see us. Um, right now we're seeing about 50 students a day uh, with everyone else largely remote. Our focus was customer service, which was really critical. We had to relook at what that would mean for us when we went remote due to the pandemic. Um, what we do specifically is we started out with all tier one services. So all of those repetitive uh, baseline questions and things that students need, anything that pretty much a person would need to take them from a student, wherever they are through our doors and, and into a seat, those are all the services that we perform again in admissions, financial aid, records and registration, um, and also cashiering. We also took over onboarding, which means anyone who indicates any type of interest in the college, um, anyone pretty much from anywhere, they can come in at, at any point and we're going to get them uh, right through the process. We're gonna move them through. If someone indicates an interest or fills out an application, it's gonna generate a call to our dashboard, et cetera. And the most recent piece there is retention. So the next branch of our department is going to be retaining students. We just launched a pilot this fall, which I'm super excited about. 
May 2018, we took over all communications so for the division. So that means anything that students receive, uh, time to apply for graduation, pre-nursing information session, low course average, all of those communications are being run through our department. And quickly, our personnel, we have currently seven full-time cross-trained technicians, which means they can speak to students about a variety of services, two part-time folks, one student worker. Prior to the pandemic, we, were, we had about 10. Uh, we're down to about one. Four full-time advisors, a communications administrator who runs our communications, uh, a system specialist. And we also have, who is not included on there, Reggie, who's our chatbot. It's augmented intelligence. Um, so he also assists us and works 24 seven with helping us to onboard our students. So in a sense, we had to take this whole operation um, where our cornerstone was again, customer service, take the whole thing. And we had 36 hours to make it remote where we stayed from March, 2020, all the way through this last July. If we could please advance. So I wanted to start with remote challenges. So immediately when we went remote, you know, we think of, of the initial challenge being, okay, the technology, but there were so many more things than that. Um, for example, you know, I have, this, I have this cake here because when I think of the, of the student experience and what students are looking for, what they're looking for is the end result. Students are not, oh, it looks like if we could just go back to the cake, thank you. Um, you know, students, they're not, they're not involved in the back end of what we do. They're interested in this experience. They want to know that if they call us and they have these six different things going on, that we're going to wrap that all up for them, get them the information they need. Now, it was one thing when they were coming into the office, but then that we, when we went remote, that was a whole new thing. So in a sense, when I was thinking about our remote challenges, I think they largely fell into the supervisory categories, information, and of course, our service standards, that was huge. That's why students were coming to us. So first, the technology piece, when we were back in the office, I could see what everyone was doing. I could walk by, I could observe. I had a really good sense of what was going on. 36 hours, you know, we went remote. I didn't have the insight that I previously had. Staffing became another issue. Some folks were more equipped than others to work remotely, to use the technology that we had. We also had to figure out what technology we even needed. It wasn't always necessarily only my insight, but we also had to figure out, okay, students are used to reaching out to us in these ways. How do we make sure that they still have a connection to us? Because we're the front line of the college. Data, I had to figure out what type of data do we need to make sure that we're still providing this experience and that we're still assisting students. We also had conflicting priorities, multiple stakeholders. It's not uncommon for us to take on an ad hoc campaign, students who have unpaid balances or students who haven't logged into the LMS to get their courses uh, started. So, you know, there was all these, there's all these things that come down to us, all these different campaigns. And we always are in this position or rather I'm in this position of making the decision of which one, you know, has to come first. So again, we had that, especially going remote. Um, students definitely had their share of difficulty as we saw in the previous slide, 63%, you know, are largely face-to-face -face, and they were in the situation where they had to work the technology themselves. The other piece here too is presence. So for me as a supervisor, it meant that I had to think, how does the staff know that, that I'm here? What do they need to know? What do my online behaviors look like? I'm someone I have very little social media, so it was an adjustment period for me as well. The next piece, you know, as far as challenges is the information piece. Students, you know, they would call to test us sometimes, you know, this person said this, you're saying it this way. If so much as wording or phrasing was different, it could be a source of, of frustration for students. The other thing that really came out when we went remote was that we all have access to the same information, but our interpretations of it are different. The way that we store and manage it is different. So it was really important that our information was consistent and that it was accurate and also easy to access. Then we have our service standards, right? For me, this is like, this is like the cake. This is like the, the end result, the final product, the student experience. It's their perception of us. Just like I had to think about how does my staff know that I'm here? Collectively, we had to think, okay, how do students know that we're here? Largely, their only way to get us was by email and by the phone. 
Previously, they would stop into our office. We would queue them in, in our queuing system. But now it's the, the phone was their primary point of contact with us. So the, our answer rates became very important. We needed students to know that we were still there. We didn't have visual cues. So again, that was a challenge. If someone was getting frustrated, they weren't getting what they needed. We didn't have those visual cues to, you know, assist with those things. We had to think about our wording and our tone. If we could please advance to the next slide. So that brings us to, what do we do about that? What, what did we learn about helping staff to create remote connections for students? So taking it a piece at a time, initially in the supervisory component, I had to figure out what analytics I needed to make sure that students were experiencing these connections with us. So initially, what that meant was I had to think about phones, phones the primary tool. When are students answering? When are we getting our most calls? Um, how many calls are we answering? How many are we leaving or are, are going unanswered? How many voicemails are we getting? All those little pieces contributed to this. I also had to be really creative with resources. So the next piece I learned was once I started getting this baseline data in place, um, we had a homegrown dashboard which pulled information from our phone system. And I started to see that, wow, we're really missing some students here. At one point, I think our answer rate was 46%. And you know that, that was really enlightening and also really concerning because it's really hard to build connections with students when, when they're not being answered. And we know from previous surveys that for the students, their biggest concern is that there is someone who's answering the phone. They wanna know that we're here. In fact, in one survey that we did at our school, students said it was more important for somebody to be nice to them than even getting the correct information, which was really interesting for us you know, as, as administrators. And so that was really key for me. I had to be really creative with my resources and call on folks who were either being furloughed if that was possible or folks from other departments, athletics, who you know, had different, you know, different responsibilities and pockets of time, train them really quickly on what they could expect students to be calling about and get them on our phone lines. Uh, we also had to reimagine virtual training. We inherited people from other departments. And so I largely had to figure out well, what, what do we currently have that I could be utilizing better our learning management system for one, which is Canvas. That was another piece. So I had to then take our training, make sure that it was all in alignment, that it could be again, accessed by anyone that I was putting on the phone. The next piece here, and again, I know I'm going through this quickly. Um, so I look forward to your questions at the end is the reinforcement piece. Something that became really clear to me was I had to really look at what I was reaching out to staff about. I remember I looked at my communications over a course of two days and I realized I was emailing people about phone call rates, but was I saying good morning? Um, again, as someone with a limited social media presence, I had to think about how I was being perceived and how I was going to positively reinforce these behaviors. So just like I had to reach out if I was seeing dipping phone call rates, I also had to say great job and make sure that I was making those things public so that everyone could see this reinforcement. And then, you know, hand in hand with that comes the reflection piece. Who am I online as a supervisor? And what does that look like for staff? How do they know, again, that I'm here? What behaviors am I reinforcing? What habits am I modeling for the staff? Because when you're online, you can't see each other, but you can certainly have an online presence, uh, which we did through Microsoft Teams. That was one way. The other piece here is the why. This was a really big takeaway for me, especially because again, when you're on the phones like that, I might be asking someone to say, make a hundred phone calls. And our goal was always, you know, we wanted to see a 30% answer rate or I would shift the time at which we were making the calls. So for me, you know, a 30% answer rate is great, but if you're the person who's making the calls and you call a hundred people and only 30 people answer, you're leaving all these voicemails. So for me as a supervisor, I'm thinking of TED Talks that I've seen. I read a book by Simon Sinek, uh, The Power of Why. And I had to really make sure, especially in this remote environment, that I consistently made the connection between each task that we were doing and the larger picture. How does making these hundred phone calls connect to the departmental mission, to the college's mission, and making these alignments and connections really, really clear? And the last piece here is habits. 
when you're online, there are some, you know, it's those habits become really abundantly clear. Who's saying good morning? Who's checking in? Who's saying good afternoon? Which questions are we, are we asking? It can be hard. And, you know, the staff express that it's really hard when you're showing up in front of your computer in pajamas, you know, to, you know, now you have to make 200 phone calls to these students in this given time period, et cetera. So, um, I remember reading, I believe it was Charles Duhigg, and it was The Power of Habit, I believe. And part of of what he talks about are building on habits of excellence, which is something that we're always talking about as a staff. We started that conversation remote, and we're continuing it uh, in the office as well. What does excellence look like? If we could please advance to the next slide. Information, okay. So this is a close-up of Monica from Friends. This is her closet. And whenever I think about going remote and the sheer information we had to store, I think about this closet. When you're walking by, it probably looked very nice, very tidy. And then as soon as you open the door, all these bits and pieces come out. So for us, part of this, um, you know, creating connections with students and the information that we were managing was to make sure that it was accessible. So in the office, people would have binders and post-its and, you know, all kinds of things everywhere. But when you're remote and students are looking at you as their, their lifeline, they need to make sure that the information that they're receiving is, is accurate and it's consistent. So the first thing, one of the big takeaways was creating a repository. Where is this information held? It's not easy to, you know, go through 600 emails to see something that someone said about the new graduation process. Where does that, where does that go? And so for us, it, it partly lived in Canvas, which was our learning management system, as well as Microsoft Teams, um, which we use for storage, as well as informal communication, which is really important. It's not just that we're making X number of phone calls. It's also, good morning. How are you today? And accessing the information that we need in a really good, clear way. We also largely used, um, we used this before the pandemic, but we definitely pulled more information and pulled it differently. We use Recruit, which is a CRM. It's very powerful. And for retention, we're currently using Advise. If we could go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So, you know, in the first, in the first part of the presentation, um, there was a picture of a cake. So the part that we had to make go remote was all this background work. So when I picture all the things that we do in the background, I picture like a scene from Where's Wally? You know, there's all these different things going on at once, but students don't need to see that. However, in order for students to get to that experience that they're looking for, all those things need to happen. And we needed to make sure that they were still happening remotely. So First, we still use a bucket approach. We use that with our CRM, which means that students aren't assigned to a particular person for the purpose of immediacy and continuity. Students care that they're getting their information quickly and right away, and that there's no break in the conversation. If one person calls them on a Tuesday about tutoring, they wanna know that that same conversation is gonna pick up on Wednesday, even if it's a different person. We also had to make sure that our communication was intrusive and proactive. So instead of, calling students and saying, you know, we're welcoming you to the college, you know, right? Because we did a lot of welcoming, even though we were remote due to the pandemic, we were saying things like, have you taken your placement test? Let's get it scheduled. Or um, have you completed the FAFSA? It's right here. Let's get your laptop out. What day are you going to complete it? Tuesday. Okay. I'm going to give you a call Wednesday morning to see how it went. Again, all of those communications being logged in the CRM. Um, phone language, the verbal and nonverbal pieces were important. You know, you think phone and then nonverbal, how does that fit? I, you know, I tell my staff all the time that students can, like, they can hear the smile in your voice. So if you're sitting there and you're not feeling it that day, students, you know, they can pick it up in the tone of your voice. Culture of feedback. So in this piece, this is where we needed to see what each other was doing. Um, you know, again, in the office, we could hear how calls were going, or we could hear how even what was happening in the inbox, because we'd walk out of our offices, hear what was going on. So the way that we did that was through WebEx, was through screen sharing. And one of the great things that came out of it was we did create a culture of feedback where the staff could see what each other was doing and say, you know, I heard that didn't go so well. What about this? 
affirming language, that became really critical. Instead of telling students what they can't do, we can tell them what they can do. So for example, if a student's classes were dropped due to non-payment, our focus would be, well, let's help you get back in. You know, so changing the way that we were phrasing things, um, making sure we were using student focus language, which was a big takeaway from the pandemic. You know, we're talking to students on the phone. We don't have those visual cues, so we can't see that they're, you know, perhaps not getting, a, the, getting the information the way that we think they are. So students would be saying, my money, where, you know, we're saying financial aid. So again, making sure that we're using language that students understand and that they're used to. And of course, listening between the lines, um, any barriers that come up, how was that going? Um, and then connecting students to resources as we go. And if we could just advance to the last slide, I believe. So again, to summarize, I know I went through this really quickly, lessons learned were for the, for the data piece, um, I like numbers, but there was also this qualitative aspect too. So it wasn't just like the numbers of outgoing phone calls. It wasn't just the reports from the CRM. It was also pulling from the notes. How are those conversations going and what's being discussed? Teams also, and I know other people use things like Slack. Um, I've seen teams. There's a couple others that I've heard. The helpful piece is that all that information is, is public. You, you can see what people are discussing. You can see the information that's being shared. Um, habits, again, that connects back to habits of excellence and what that looks like in the remote environment, getting up, saying good morning, um, speaking to each other on Teams, language, tone, and presence on the phones, which were, again, our primary point of communication for students. Our averages for our phones, they far surpass what we were getting in our inbox. Um, and lastly, the informal communication, making sure that that's there for staff connections and then recognizing the small moments, the successes that are happening because there surely were those and not just focusing on, you know, the, the, the big picture. Um, while that was important with the quantitative data, the conversations that were happening and the connections that were made were also critical and recognizing those. Kate, thank you so much for sharing uh, your experiences. We have, we're have we gonna move to the next talk in just a moment, but there was one sort of burning question from a few folks uh, in the oh. chat, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah. No, and that had to do with, um, you talked a lot about you know primarily using the phone to reach out to students. Did you consider text messaging or other technologies? Could you just just for a moment talk about, uh, about that and, and how you reach students? Oh, certainly. So again, we do have a chatbot. Our chatbot's name is Reggie. Reggie is augmented intelligence and students reach out to Reggie uh, all the time. After a student applies, um, we do have that texting platform and Reggie is largely used. But what, what will happen with augmented intelligence is that there are questions that Reggie can't answer or things that are really complex or students who they, they just want to talk to a person. And that seemed to really come through during the pandemic because students wanted, they wanted to know that there was still a, a person there. So while I think, I wanna say Reggie saved about 820 staff hours um, within like six months of the pandemic, I believe is what it was calculated out to be. But there was still that overwhelming need for students to, they, they wanted to hear a hello on the other end. So yes to the text messaging. Thank you so much. All right, sure. well, we'll save some time for additional Q and A at the end. Um, we're going to go ahead and jump to our next lightning talk, which is eight lessons learned, providing a robust and engaging orientation to create online learning success. So I want to go ahead and kick it over to Megan Drulia from Wayne State University and Stephanie Williams from Mesa Community College for the next piece. Thank you, Joy. Megan, if you could advance the slides for us, that would be great. like Jeopardy music should be playing. I think that's her, your Megan at WCET. Yeah. Yeah. I apologize, I don't have control over the slides or I would do it. There she goes.
So Megan and Stephanie, maybe you just want to introduce yourself while we get the slides going, if you wouldn't mind. So I'm going to start and I'm Stephanie Williams from Mesa Community College. I'm in the e-learning manager. I actually work in the e-learning department. Um, my department is actually pretty small, but we partnered with our um, new student orientation area that actually falls under um, recruitment and admissions to develop the online uh, orientation and new student orientation offered online to um, get this project going. Looks like Megan Raymond got this. Are you able to see the slides now? Yeah. Okay. We can roll. I've got them going so we can roll forward. All right. So, yep. And we're all ready. <laughs> okay. All right. So, I'll just go through a little bit about my college. Mesa Community College is a traditional two year institution. We are part of the um, Mesa County Community College District, or Maricopa Community College District, sorry. And we are the largest of the 10 colleges in the district, followed by uh, Glendale Community College. And we are actually not fully online. The only college in the district is that is fully online is Rio Salado. And we also took a bit of a hit before the pandemic. We ranged around 20 to 22,000 students. 49% um, of our student population is first generation. And we transfer about 16,000 students to Arizona Public Universities. We are recently approved as an HSI and about 69% are part-time and 31% are full-time. Um, a little bit about our uh, orientation, and you'll see at the very bottom, Thor in a comic book style, Thor the Thunderbird is our mascot. And behind him is actually our green space. And the clock tower is one of the most recognizable locations on campus. That's a little bit of fun for you guys. Uh, Thor the Thunderbird <laughs> actually is um, also the Thor is actually the name of the orientation. Thunderbird orientation and registration is the name of the orientation. So a lot of people also go with Soar. So ours is named Thor. Um, and that carries across from our face-to-face -face orientation as well. So because of the pandemic, we actually canceled face-to-face -face orientation. So we just were fully online. We had a version of orientation um, that was online in Canvas, our learning management system before, and that started the March before the pandemic. And that was a limited version. Um, it was only for student athletes and any students that weren't able to attend the face-to-face -face version. So because it was a limited version, um, we weren't really, I guess, uh, running it fully to capacity. It was managed primarily by my department. Um, it had limited access. Uh, it's, you can see by that first bullet, that orientation is mandatory, comes with a student hold. It's also a combined hold for students, meaning it's a registration and advising hold. So the students have to speak to an advisor first. And once the pandemic hit and we had about, I think at that time we had about 18,000 students. And that hold um, is for students who are new to college. And we have a, that last bullet says about 3,000 to 3,500 new students going through orientation annually. And that first pandemic year, we were about 4,000 students. So it's gone down since then. Um, we looked for a partner and in that, in that search, we found Innovative Educators. And that's who we partnered with to be able to get um, our new students into orientation. And the first thing we partnered with them on was the orientation to online learning. And that was kind of our proof of concept to leadership to say, hey, we can do this, we can do it single sign-on. Um, 
so that students don't have to remember a new password. We can get data into the system and we use that to say we can move four into a better platform out of Canvas because we were actually having issues getting those 4,000 students from, um, from being prospective students into our SIS and getting them registered for classes because prospective students don't have access to Canvas. <laughs> so they love the new platform. They love the availability of the resources and they love the fact that students were getting um, an orientation to online learning because we had all of these new students who hadn't necessarily signed up to be online learners. So that was our proof of concept. They said, this is great. Our president um, said, can we keep Thor? <laughs> so we kept Thor as our mascot for orientation. Um, Innovative Educators was awesome at branding everything with our Mesa colors. So you see the logo there as well. So we kept our Mesa blue, we kept Thor and our banners um, for all of our, all, all of our lessons. They were great with that. Our president was really impressed with the way Thor stayed throughout everything. Um, and that was something that, that was really important to us because as a two year college, you don't really think of a mascot as being something that's central to the process of onboarding new students. But for us, um, our Thunderbird, Thunderbird shows up across campus, shows up at all the events, um, and shows up in orientation for all of our new students. Additionally, you see that we have a small advising team for first semester students, and that's our new student welcome team. And that's the first kind of gateway to orientation. That's where our students get that first semester um, checklist. So the lessons learned that we took away uh, from, from working with innovative educators were to, and the images at the bottom go kind of hand in hand with each one of these bullet points, are to align your, new, your student learning outcomes. And these are ours for our first year experience. And our orientation are aligned to these to include feedback from key stakeholders. And we brought together a team of all of our stakeholders because if your orientation is like ours, it can sometimes become a dumping ground for everything anybody across the college wants to put in there. So we took feedback and made everybody feel welcome to include their feedback in it but we did take it down from two hours to about 45 minutes to complete, even bringing it online. Um, assess student learning. So each of our lessons has a knowledge check at the end so we can get that feedback. And then we have a short 10 question knowledge check at the end so we can still get feedback from student learning. And then keep the content short and easy to digest. One of the things that we loved about the innovative educators model is that everything is, um, modularized or chunked, just like students are used to seeing in their LMS. And you see that screenshot directly from um, our orientation and that last image, just like students are used to seeing in their online learning um, classroom. So that's kind of a really quick overview of my experience and I will pass it over to Megan. Thanks, Stephanie. Uh, it, hearing you talk a little bit about your experience, I felt like we have we we have very similar experiences, challenges, and um, used a similar platform to overcome those. So uh, that was really fun to hear. Um, oh, can we go back a slide? Yes. So I am um, a staff member in the School of Information Sciences at Wayne State University. Um, a little bit about us, we are um, a fairly small school situated within a larger public four-year institution. Uh, we're in an urban setting. We're located in downtown Detroit. Uh, we have about 450 adult learners in our school. Uh, most of them are career changers. Uh, the majority of our students are about 30 to 40 years old with our average being about 32. And uh, the overwhelming majority are also part-time. So many of them have a lot of other obligations you know, jobs and families. And uh, that's why they've come to us. Uh, we offer two graduate degrees as well as four certificate programs. 
all of those at the graduate level and all of them online. Uh, we've had our, our curriculum online for about 10 years now. Um, so we, I know many people switched to online learning during the pandemic, but we had already been doing it for quite some time. Um, and, and the same for our orientation. Um, our, our goals for orientation, we've, we've tried a lot of different formats and a lot of different requirements. We've had physical orientation, we've had um, orientation in Canvas and Blackboard. Uh, we've had it where you're required to do orientation in order to stay registered and start your classes. We've had it where it's just highly recommended and we don't track students anymore. So we've, we've done a little bit of everything. Uh, but even through all of that, our, our goals have remained the same. So, you know, we're looking to introduce our new students to our learning community, uh, you know, that being their fellow students, but also our faculty and our staff. Uh, we're looking to um, establish the norms and expectations that they can expect as an online graduate student. Um, you know, we're a little bit different than undergrads. So we have a lot of educating to do about that process and what that looks like. And, and many of them, um, you know, being career changers, they didn't take online classes as undergrad. So, you know, we're, we're sort of the, the front line with, with teaching them how to do that. And then uh, we, we like to share career paths with our students. Um, it's a really important part of who we are as a school. Uh, that part of our reputation is that, you know, we're kind of practice driven, we're practical, we're hands on. So we want our incoming graduate students to have an idea of, you know, the possibilities that are open to them. And, you know, our flagship degree is our Master of Library and Information Science, and that trains future librarians. But there's also a lot more things you can do um, with what we're offering our students, um, you know, information analysis and research. Uh, so we really, we try to use our orientation, you know, twofold to, to bring them into our learning community, teach them about what they can expect as being a member of our school. But we also want to set them up for success when they leave us. So knowing those career paths, knowing the support that's available to them, and also uh, to infuse a little bit of that storytelling so that they know, um, you know, some of our alumni, the paths that they've taken um, so that they can hopefully see themselves in those stories. And can we go to the next slide? Um, so as I said, we, we had um, offered our orientation, uh, our first foray into online orientation was in Canvas and Blackboard. And like Stephanie mentioned, it was really difficult um, to onboard students in using the learning management system because they needed to be registered for students before they could get in. And so that was sort of, um, it was causing some friction with our incoming students, with our faculty. They felt that students weren't as prepared as they wanted them to be because many of them weren't even getting into orientation until after classes had started. Um, and that's really what led us uh, to looking for a new solution. So. Uh, similar to Stephanie, we're using go to orientation that's offered by innovative educators, and that has been a, a really great um, advancement for, for our students and, and what we offer online for them. Um, so I just wanted to share a few of our quick tips uh, from designing an online orientation uh, in general, but also with innovative educators. Um, first being that having that built in assessment feedback loop is so important. Um, knowing what our learners think that are going through it. Um, you know, sometimes when you're so close to the information that it's, it's kind of hard to see uh, where, you know, there might be gaps at, in, in terms of explaining things. So at the end of our orientation, students to get their completion of certificate, uh, completion certificate, they have to answer that survey about what they thought of it, if they, if they still had unanswered questions, uh, whether they thought that it led them to feel more connected to our school, what they thought of the information. And we've really used that. Uh, we've leaned on that very heavily in terms of the adjustments that we've made. So we, um, you know, have added new modules and we've broken out data, you know, based on that feedback. So that was really critical. Um, I would also encourage you to consider how your synchronous opportunities align with your asynchronous connection opportunities. Uh, in addition to the orientation modules, we offer faculty meet and greets and advising events. We have student groups that offer um, synchronous connections. And we also do uh, drop-ins for technology for our students, since that's a big component of online education. 
Uh, we also cultivated buy-in from our stakeholders. So our associate dean and our dean have gone through the orientation. Our faculty have gone through the orientation and provided feedback. And we've also had our graduate assistants do it as well so that as their, you know, our graduate students are current students, so they can help us fill in uh, the gaps of what they see as current students, what would be helpful to them. And then finally, my, my last tip is to reverse engineer your content for your goal, from your goals and, and outcomes that um, regardless of our format or requirements, we've always had a set of goals that we've worked backwards from, and that really has helped us streamline um, to whether, uh, you know, the content fits, you know, we talked a little bit about like the overflowing closet or, you know, people wanting everything to be in orientation, but using those outcomes and goals as a way of making sure that everything fits has been really helpful. And then um, I also shared a little, just a couple of graphics about um, from our, our, end, our exit survey about students, you know, how they felt about their connection, how they felt about the information. And the overwhelming majority really did feel that they felt more connected to our school from going through the online orientation platform. And that they also felt the information was really valuable. So that sort of reaffirms our design decisions, our content decisions, um, and also critical because many of our students will never step foot on our campus. So I know that was quick and I'm happy to answer any questions, but thank you for letting me share a bit about our online orientation experience. Thank you so much, Megan and Stephanie. Um, there was one question I wanted to get to, um, which was, you know, essentially how do, how do you build community uh, among those students who are, are not yet students, right? Going through these orientations and, you know, what do you find that students need or want uh, in that process? And, and either or both of you could answer that. Also for our students, you know, we, uh, we try to connect our students with current students. So as they're coming through, uh, we have a graduate student assistant that um, is partnered with our recruitment person. So many times uh, she'll reach out to, to prospective students um, on the phone or she'll email them personally to try to give them a connection uh, to someone who's sort of a peer uh, to start building that earlier. Um, we've also found that a lot of um, our incoming students have said they've essentially chose us because of our responsiveness and how quick we are to get back to them. So I think that also helps them feel like there's real people on the other end by um, having a quick response time and you know just being accessible. That's great. And there was also quite a bit of interest in the platform. Both of you switched uh, platforms, it sounds like, from what you were using prior. Um, you know, any, any advice for others who may be considering that? Um, for us, it, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't a really easy decision um, because there's always, you know, there's always a financial component and, you know, we're a public two-year college. And everybody knows what that means. <laughs> um, but like I said, we had the, we used the online modules as our proof of concept because um, that's where the need was, right? We were going into COVID. That's exactly where the need was, was for online learning. So proving that to leadership, showing them, you know, our students are moving online. This is where the need is showing them um, the usage rates <laughs> because that wasn't something that was mandatory and students were voluntarily going in um, and completing those modules on their own. Um, and exactly like Megan was sharing with, with her data, we had the surveys at the end and students were choosing um, to complete it and giving us feedback. And then we went to leadership and said, hey, Students are completing these. We have thousands of students going in and doing this on their own. And, um, and on top of that, they're completing the surveys and telling us that these are useful and, and they're stating that it's going to be help, helpful for them in the future. So we, it kind of solved itself. Um, I love that focus on the student experience and, and look, you know, looking at the, the trends and where students are going. Thank you both. Um, we're gonna jump ahead now to our last presentation and we'll, we'll post these slides by the way for everyone. So if you didn't quite catch uh, what's here, it'll be up on the, the WCT uh, conference site. Um, but our next presentation is Student Support 2.0 an Innovative Team Approach. And I believe we're gonna start off with um, Nicole Letchworth um, from Instructional Connections 
She'll be joined, joined by Amanda Hawkins from Columbus State and Tracia Foreman from the University of Texas, Rio Grande. So take it away. Hi, my name is Nicole Letchworth. Thank you so much for having me. Um, my role is a program manager with Instructional Connections, where we place what we call academic coaches as an additional support for faculty and students in the online classroom. I actually started as an, oh, can you guys go ahead and advance the slide? Thank you. Um, I actually started as an academic coach in 2006 because I was a student who had an academic coach and I was at the time working on a master's degree, had an academic coach, found it to be very helpful. Um, the support was just exactly what I needed because I had never taken online courses before at that time. I was working on my second master's and had obtained my first one live and in person. So it was a huge culture shock for me to take courses online. And I had this coach who was just amazing. I don't think I could have completed the program without her help. I got a job as an academic coach and since have made the difference in the lives of many students that I've worked with across the years. So as an academic coach, we are an added support to the online classroom. We work with faculty members, we collaborate with them. We do not design courses, we just add an extra layer of support. Um, we help students, we answer student emails, we're available seven days a week where sometimes faculty may not be. Um, I've answered emails within hours of students sending them. I've been able to get on the phone with students and assist um, you know, with finding course materials in their online courses because it's very overwhelming. Um, when you take an online course, there's just a lot of reading in a lot of different places, and sometimes you can't remember where you've seen something. So academic coaches help with those areas. Um, we grade student assignments. Um, we give meaningful feedback. Um, the students have been very appreciative of that in the past. We manage discussion threads. We go into the discussion boards, chat with the students, get to know them, their needs, their, um, you know, their career paths, which is always very fun. Um, to engage them in that way. And of course, we're very fast with answering student emails. Oftentimes, students who take online classes are doing most of their schoolwork on the weekends or holidays, um, traditionally when faculty members may not be as readily available. So the academic coaches step in and fill that role for faculty. So students are able to get help in a much more timely fashion, which they really do appreciate. Um, we provide students with Feedback the same way that faculty members would. We work very closely with professors, um, performing inter-rated reliability, making sure that we're leaving the same kind of feedback and grading papers the same way that they would want them graded. And overall, we our goal is just to foster a sense of community within the course. We're trying to bridge the gap between faculty members and students. Um, sometimes, unfortunately, students don't feel comfortable going to their professors, but they feel comfortable going to an academic coach. They see us more um, on, you know, as on their level, on their same level. So they're comfortable coming to us for extra help. And it is certainly um, a very rewarding experience to be able to assist students when they're taking their classes online. We've had first time students and students who are older, who've never taken online classes and students in every area in between that we've been able to support. We've supported students with learning disabilities, um, ADHD problems, um, and they have all found our services to be very helpful. Um, so with that being said, I'll go ahead and hand it over to Amanda. Thank you, Nicole. You're welcome. Um, I've been working with coaches since for 11 years now, and we love it in our program. The main reason we adopted the coaching model is because we wanted to grow our program. We have we started out 11 years ago with 15 students in an online RN to BSN program. We admitted once a year, so we knew we had to make some changes. So we adopted the carousel model, which we could admit five to seven times a year, and we did that. Um, and we went, all our classes went online, eight weeks. Um, students could be part-time, full-time, come and go. And the coaches really helped us support offering those classes more than one time a year because I was the only faculty member in the course. So it, we had to have some help. So that we got through that first year with those 15 students. And then we started um, marketing more and getting more students. So bring you to date, we have, um, in, low 200s right now. I have two faculty members and I have two coaches. And with our academic coach, 
one of our coaches that we hired, she was actually in our program and expressed to me that she wanted to be a nursing faculty member and that was her goal. She's a military spouse, has three children, she's busy, she moves. Um, she needed that flexibility. So I said, you go back and work on your master's and I'll hire you as my coach. And she, cause she just excelled in our program and she's been with me for five years and it's just a marriage made in heaven, a work marriage. Uh, and so it's just really worked out well for us. The other coach um, has been with us a couple of years too. So I have not seen a high turnover in the academic coaches and that's been a blessing. They have a, a maximum amount of courses that they can be in and a maximum amount of students. And what we were told was they can be in two courses and have a maximum of 130 students. And both of the coaches that I have, they want that every time. But in the event they didn't, I still could hire another coach to work if they had to have surgery or be out for a summer, anything like that. It's very flexible. Um, but we've just been very lucky with the two coaches that we've had. Um, the value for me, especially, is they go in and grab, grade like the routine discussion boards where everybody's really excelling and doing well and they're making that 95 or above that 90. Um, anybody that's failing, I ask them to turn them over to me and let me uh, grade their paperwork. Anybody that they think is plagiarizing or quoting too much, um, I ask them to let me grade those papers. Anytime students have any dispute over their grade, I copy all my coaches on every email. Um, but especially on those with disputing a grade, I ask them to let me answer that email um, because I want to show the student exactly where they missed um, for, for APA, or maybe they quoted too much, or maybe they didn't do it correctly. Maybe their writing's not up to par. So I want to make sure I'm in the loop and know and handle all those problems. I also handle all extensions. Any at-risk students, I call and text. So my coaches aren't doing any of that work, but they're uh, doing the grading for the typical A high B student, and it relieves me from that duty. And we communicate literally on grading days. All of our assignments are due on Sunday and Wednesday, and on grading days, which are Monday and Thursday, we're corresponding back and forth a good bit. Um, and it's very helpful. We copy each other on all our emails. They copy me on theirs. So I know exactly what's going on. I found the coaches to be just a joy to work with. They are enhancing our students. Um, we are, they are, I heard Nicole talking about uh, my nighttime. I can be anywhere at 6 a.m. until, you know, through the day, but I'm not a midnight person and my coaches are. And they, at midnight, they're answering questions on the frequently asked question board, which is very helpful to our students because they have such a quick turnaround on grades and on answering questions and emails. And it's just been a, a wonderful experience. And another person who's gonna be in our group is Tracia Foreman. And I'd like for her to go next as another faculty member that works with coaches. Thank you, Amanda. Uh, I am delighted to be here today. And I have had the pleasure of using Instructional Connection Academic Coaches for support in my courses since 2017. I teach in a large Master's of Science in Health Science graduate program that's offered completely online. And students in this program are enrolled from various healthcare-related professional programs, such as healthcare administration, clinical laboratory science, nutrition, informatics, and others. Since this program is offered in an interprofessional format, this means that students from all of the various healthcare-related professions are enrolled together in the program's core courses, like ethics, health policy, and research. Enrollment in these large core courses typically ranges from 150 to 250 students, and the use of Instructional Connections academic coaches has become essential to our program's success. Amanda and Nicole have both detailed how Coaches provide incredible academic support to our students, and I agree with everything said, but I want to describe to you a personal situation where these um, coaches stepped in and supported me as an instructor. I know for some of you, snow and cold weather is no big deal. Well, not so for deep South Texas, where, where our campus is located. And some of you may recall when historic winter storm Uri hit Texas in February 2021, where Near failure of the Texas power grid meant that power was shut down to 10 million households across the state. Our, the three county region that our campuses serve were particularly hard hit with 90% of the businesses and homes without power. Campus was closed for a week. 
I had no power or water at my home for five days. I, I'm sure all of you can just begin to imagine the chaos this caused for an online program. Since Instructional Connections academic coaches are not university employees, they don't live in the geographic region, and the coaches I work with live in several different states across the U.S. During this crisis, they were able to, to step in and be there for my students impacted by the storm, and also the 75% of the enrolled students who were not impacted by the storm, who were wondering where I disappeared to. I, I, I cannot express to you the comfort I had in knowing the students' needs were being met. And while I was trying to work from a phone that I was keeping charged by running my car several times a day. And while this, is, this situation was extreme, this kind of support offered by academic coaches to both me and my students was, was pretty typical. All of the academic coaches are highly trained, experienced faculty who are able to provide critical help as members of the instructional team. And research supports this. Research has shown students enrolled in courses taught with the use of multiple instructors report consistently higher ratings of teaching presence. Academic coaching, coaching has been documented to improve student retention. And other findings suggest that a team approach to instruction offers critical academic assistance to students that cannot be provided by a lone instructor. The creation of online instructional teams with specialized academic coaches not only supports the online instructor, but results in increased opportunities for student instructor engagement, contributing to both student success and retention. Thank you for your attention. I'm happy to share references. If anybody's interested, just reach out. Thank you so much uh, for this engaging presentation. There are a few questions that have popped up in the chat, um, specifically about uh, the, the roles of academic coaches, uh, whether they're subject matter experts, also if you have TAs and other folks. Um, that are engaged. And I, I know we've seen a couple of responses in the chat, but would you like to just address that briefly and then, then we'll wrap up the session? Sure, I'll address it. Um, we are academic coaches are subject matter experts. They are required to hold a minimum of a master's degree. Most of them hold doctoral level degrees, but we do have a lot. Everyone has at least a master's um, in their field with, and most of our academic coaches have 10 plus years of experience in their fields as well. So a good number of our academic coaches are credentialed and have enough experience to actually teach the courses themselves. Um, so they are very well prepared and well versed to be able to support both faculty and students in their role. And another question, have there been any um, local issues or concerns around either academic freedom or uh, issues with I won't say offloading some of those pieces from, uh, you know, to coaches, but um, anything that, that you would recommend for others who may be considering uh, a coach uh, or using these coaching services for their, for their courses. No, we've never seen any offloading of things. I mean, our professors love our coaches and our coaches love our professors. They're very, they work very collaboratively together. Um, the communication lines of communication are always kept open. We do require our academic coaches to reach out to faculty members regularly and have conference calls, not just through email. And most times the beauty of our model is that when um, after the first course is over and everything is said and done, oftentimes the, the faculty members, and I'm sure Amanda and Tricia can attest to this, they will ask for their same coaches to come back. Um, and build oh, this sure. wonderful collaborative relationship together where the expectations are known. Thank you so much. I wanna thank all of our wonderful presenters today um, for sharing their insights and their experiences across uh, what certainly has been just an incredible and fascinating time in the transformation of, of online uh, services for students. Uh, the contact information for everyone is here. I, uh, if you have additional questions we didn't get to today, please feel free to follow up with any or all of our presenters. Uh, again, thank you so much. So I'll just thank everyone for joining us today. Um, WCT really appreciates you. Uh, and we also always encourage you to bring a friend or colleague to these events and, and help support the important work that WCT does. Um, please uh, do, do us a favor, complete the survey back in the virtual session, you'll find a survey for this session 
uh, provide a review and we'll share that back with the team. So thank you so much and enjoy the rest of the conference.